Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Dr. Kristen vogt Vegaberg, who is a director for a STEM program, independent writer, and obviously as a doctor, a PhD recipient. Uh, Kristen, welcome to the show. Hi, Bart. It's a good time to be here. I, I love having non-drummer guests on the show because I think um, you bring a really interesting perspective. And uh, today's topic is really cool because it's the scientific reason why humans love drumming. And I know my listeners will love it because maybe we don't know why we love <laughs> drums the way we do. <laughs> so, all right. Obviously, you've got a very, uh, you know, in- impressive career here as a writer and all this stuff. And and I want to mention up front that I found this article. It's it's on Massive Science, which is MassiveSci.com. And interestingly enough, my brother-in-law, Zach Horn, sent it to me, also not a drummer. I think he was on a uh, like a football website. And they like link to non-football things. And boom, <laughs> you came up. A lot of times my articles pop up in the strangest of places. But that's one of the fun things about uh, the written word is you never know due to our algorithms online what's going to pop up next. You know, for all you yeah. know, you're on Amazon and because you clicked on one thing, now you're being given an article about Marie Antoinette. You know, you never know what's going to happen next. Exactly. All right, jumping in here. Why don't we start at the top and go back as far as we can and you can kind of just Tell us, why do we love drums the way that we do? So I'm going to start off with um, addressing the science that we're going to be going through. So a lot of times we think science, we think like very heavy. This is about chemistry. This is about numbers. This is physics. This is going to be a lot more about both behavior and um, a big focus on anthropology as well, which is the study of humanity. And in this case, we're talking a little bit about primates at first. So a little bit of my background, I'm a, mem- I'm a fellow for the Society for Applied Anthropology. I've worked as, I've worked as a researcher for quite some time involving behavioral uh, analysis really within learning, and that's actually my background. Mm. And I absolutely love studying how people behave. And a huge part of that is also studying our cousins, you know, in this case, primates. And sure. a big thing is that, and I addressed this very quickly in the beginning of the article, the first sign that we see is uh, beating as used as a sign of aggression. So, for instance, macaques. Um, these are, you know, your typical, if you see wild monkeys out in like either Thailand or India. So they're very, very intelligent. And they often use trees to beat out rhythm to intimidate others encroaching in their area. And then other highly intelligent apes, namely chimpanzees, also use crude drumming sounds namely just slapping a tree or slapping a log to signify, hey, I'm here and I'm not in a good mood. And, you know, one of the common things that we think of in a lot of times within human society is the war drum. So, and obviously this war drum has so many different looks. You know, you think of, you know, the little drum said the little drummer boy but i'm like no that's like a nice christmas story (laughs) Uh, but you do think of the you know the drumming that happens at the beginning of a battle and a lot of these old timey wars or you know these other big war drums and all these other things and it's because it's it can be such an aggressive beat as you probably well know and i also immediately talk about heavy metal that's a great example of that and then there is the opposite of that, the drum circle. That's Which I like, love how in the article you call heavy metal's softer cousin, uh, the drum circle. <laughs> I'll be frank. Um, to talk about the what came about with this was the theme of stoned science. And so I got my undergraduate degree at University of Oregon. And I also did a half year at Berkeley at, as well in California, both of which are notorious glorious hippie yeah. <laughs> hippie schools definitely uh and drum circles were a big part of it in fact i did uh african dance actually at university of oregon everybody was doing the african dance class cool. um it was a lot of fun our professor was from burkina faso in west africa and instead of having recorded music play for us while we danced we actually had a series of drummers the head drummer was from Mali in West Africa. And I talk a little bit about drums, namely the djembe from Mali. And they played live for us. And that was actually my first experience really with djembe drums and how that was used. And I was like, wow, we always see this drum everywhere. And I should mention this literally happened. This definitely dates me. 
This happened the exact same year that that South Park episode came out. You know, the hippie one <laughs> where Cartman is looking for hippies. Yeah. And he's just like, oh, too many hippies. Going to start a drum circle. That's Jackson. hysterical. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, they let a whole bunch get in there and it behave like a mile wide drum circle. <laughs> but now we'll know the science behind why that happens, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I did an episode with Dr. Edward Large, which was about how primates and all these animals use rhythm. And it was really interesting. People can check that out before. It's so long ago, I feel like I've forgotten more than I uh, can remember. But that science of, of it's just kind of like, I love how it's inherent. I mean, it is literally, there's something about drums and rhythm that it we're, we're hardwired to just be, I guess you could say, scared of it with the war drum sounds, to be intimidated by it to be kind of curious about it, to be um, drawn in to try it, to hit things. It's just, that's so fascinating that it's its just in us. I mean, obviously, some people are born to play the piano and they're born to play guitar. You know, they love it. But percussion, it's just so like, it's the original instrument. Mm hmm. And well, that's one of the most interesting things I thought, and I couldn't quite quote it, but um, visiting the Museum of Pop Culture in Seattle, there actually is a fantastic horror exhibit that's all about, you know, horror movies and what makes them scary. And one thing they talk about is in the soundtracks, a lot of times the really scary gentle beat mm -hmm. uh, is evolutionary to us because as humans, that's the first sound we hear when we are in our mother's uteruses developing as humans. Yeah. That is the first sound our eardrums hear. And for us, that's so hardwired to this is something primal. This is the first thing I've heard. And so that's why a lot of times a gentle drum can be very soothing, but a very aggressive drum is going to make you scared. And yeah. yeah, I'm like, I wish I could find that article. It turns that. Yeah, but I've heard the bass drum, the big drum can often be referred to as the mother drum because it's it feels like a heartbeat, exactly like yeah. you're saying, where it's it's just kind of like, uh, you know, that boom, 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 boom. Exactly. And uh, so if you haven't read any of his work before, jo Joseph Jordania, who I quote a lot in this article, he really said it's also our need for social communication and that's that humming and that gentle rhythm, that gentle sound for babies, you know, keeping that tone and keeping that gentle pace. And it's not an offbeat rhythm. It's a steady, gentle, I'm lulling you into something. Yeah. And that's a huge part of the drum circle where people are like, okay, I'm going to be drawn towards this because it's a place where I feel safe. Or in the case of like a music festival or some of the drum circles I've uh, <laughs> experienced as an undergraduate, it's fun and it's lighthearted and, oh, okay, everybody's out here in the woods playing some drums. I'm going to dance in the middle of it. Yeah, exactly. Oh. I, I had my uh, music festival days when I was younger where it's like, you know, it's all some iteration of the Grateful Dead and like people following them around and then a bunch of other bands. But now, okay, this is kind of a, as a drummer, I'll say this, there's something, it's more pleasurable, I think, if you're a part of it, even if you're dancing, if you're playing and if you're performing versus maybe if you're walking by and you can go, that doesn't sound that good. But the second you start um, being included in it and playing it, things sound better and you feel more involved. And I'm really thinking about, I was just watching this documentary on HBO about Woodstock 99, um, which was really fascinating and just at how awful that event turned out with people being like uh, overheated, people dying and just trashing riots. But anyway, why I'm saying that is because there was a portion where a lot of these, as they say in the uh, documentary, angry young white guys started to take all the trash cans and turn them into a metal trash can drum circle. And it sounded horrible, but it's like <laughs> if you're in that circle of like guys who are drunk and overheated playing them, then you like it. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? It yeah. And I wonder if that also stems back to once again, we're socially wired when we are in part of something then we're going to be drawn into it as opposed to walking past it. Yeah. 
And I mean, that's one of the fascinating things to go back to the article um, about how universal drums are across cultures. Like, and that was one of, for me, that's one of the most fascinating parts about researching for a lot of these articles that I've written. And especially for this one, because when I'm finding something that can be seen as universal, I'm like, this really is such an interesting part of our evolution as a species and also as a, you know, universal culture of sorts. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I talk about, you know, it's interesting that you brought up the drum circles made out of just trash cans. And because it's like, ugh, there's, uh, I've heard some people say that, well, anything can be a drum. And I'm like, well, it technically. <laughs> <laughs> Technically, that's true. <laughs> Should it be? As, no. <laughs> as you pointed out, I'm not a musician. Um, although I learned how to play a few instruments when I was younger. I should mention I did learn how to play the piano and I played it for many years. Uh, but I also play the tuba and the clarinet, which of all the instruments I've played, I've actually enjoyed the tuba the best because it involved the least amount of different notes. And it also just focused on a bass. Yeah. Yeah. And... One of the most fascinating things about this, too, I should mention um, in undergrad, in addition to dealing with a lot of drum circles, I also was an archaeology assistant at our museum on campus at University of Oregon. And so that was one of the fascinating things was being able to bring some of my archaeology background, even though, once again, just an undergrad, no, no peer reviewed research under my name for that one. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. Well, you know, you say you learn piano. Piano is obviously kind of at its core, a percussive instrument as it's being struck the strings. So there you go. You're kind of a, you're, you're a percussionist uh, in some way. <laughs> Thank you. Going back way back I, in your article, you talk about the earliest drums are found in China and Vietnam um, with religious rites and things like that. Maybe expand upon that a little bit. Do you know more info about those types of drums that were found? Oh my gosh, they're all over the place. And um, with one with those, they tended to be a little bit more, uh, they tended to be a little bit more handheld and they started evolving. Um, but one thing that was very interesting is that uh, looking at the people who played them, it was a lot of time connected with a spiritual world. Mm. Uh, with, okay, if you're going to learn how to play an instrument, it's because you are going to be talking to either ancestors or deities. Um you know, and not only that, but other instruments as well, including, as I mentioned in the article, flutes are a big one that they found. And especially a lot of times these are found in very high ranking burial places. And some of the arguments also there that scientists have had is that these individuals had the time and the resources to learn how to really play the instruments, not just a, a spontaneous drum circle, but they're getting the instrument to talk and give uh make rhythm so that they're able to communicate with a different spirit. And mm. there's all sorts of different designs for that. And uh, that's especially seen in a lot of shamanistic societies. Um, I talk a little bit um, later on about how drums are held in such reverence in certain cultures uh, that some places and some people will still require that they not be treated as mere objects. And I mentioned a lot of First Nations people in Canada also, um, I had an experience uh, a couple years ago at uh, the National Art Museum of the American Veteran, National, no, National Veterans Art Museum, sorry. Sure. And it was about, the exhibit was about indigenous Americans uh, serving in various different wars. And we had Ho-Chunk elders, uh, also known as, I believe sometimes they're called Winnebago, and my two-year-old daughter at the time ran up and wanted to touch the drum. And one of the elders, like, I wouldn't, he, he like put his hands up and was like, no, you cannot touch that drum, <laughs> yeah. young young lady. Cannot touch it, ho-chunk way. And I was like, okay, I pulled her off. And he was like, yeah, you cannot touch that drum. Mm. Just don't touch it. And I was like, okay. Mm. But th that, that's how much reverence is found because it's seen, at least how he explained this to me, because I was like, this is just my experience with it. But it was held in such reverence that you know, the human hand cannot touch it because it is speaking the voice of something that is beyond human. So it's a sacred object, basically. I mean, it is extremely so. Wow. Okay. That's so beyond like, you know, someone's vintage Ludwigs that they love. It's like, uh, it is this something, it, it, it connects you to your, your religion. I mean, that's just fascinating. Now, as far as like, let's just say indigenous people, obviously there's multiple different cultures and names across the world of what that means. But 
so it, in practice, they have this sacred instrument. They are then performing. Would then people be like dancing to it? Would they be praying to it? What would be happening while the drum is being performed uh, in addition to that sound just to kind of go with the sacredness of it? What else is happening? I mean, it really depends. I mean, uh, across the Americas, I mean, there are hundreds of different First Nations tribes who do drumming for different things. So I really can't answer that because okay. you say one and there's going to be hundreds who do different things. Okay. And so in some places, in this case, it was uh, when I was at, when I was viewing the Ho-Chunk elders, it was uh, four older gentlemen. All of them were war veterans, I should mention. Uh, there were two Vietnam veterans uh, and two guys who had served in the army during the Gulf War. Um, so they had to be elders, uh, they had to be male, and they had to be veterans. And so they played it, and uh, the first round, we just had to sit and listen. And in the second round, all the elders um, walked around and uh, basically were able to do a small dance. Um, and so each time it's different, it depends on what happens. And that's just one small, I really cannot emphasize okay. this enough. That was one small experience. And there are hundreds and thousands of different ways that this can be experienced throughout the world in how people view these types of sacred drums that yeah. uh, we're not even scratching the surface here. <laughs> There's so many. Yeah. And I'm so sure many. though, it like we most drummers know that each culture, Brazil, uh, China, everywhere, there's different rhythms that go with the different cultures, which are endless. And those, those, you know, people who are great at each individual one can be, can spend a lifetime mastering those, um, particular types of rhythms and sounds. But I, I like in your article how it says archeologists have determined that the drum and the dancing it inspires served a common purpose of bringing people together, which I think is a sort of safe you know, not uh, overgeneralizing way of just like, that's what drums do is they, they bring people together. Um, obviously, we talk about war drums that might be bringing them together for <laughs> a different reason to start a war. But um, it's that's an interesting point of just bringing people together. You know, I often think of uh, the scene, however maudlin this may sound, I think of the scene in Moana, you know, Disney's Moana, yeah. the 2016 film where she's playing the drum. And that's a very different design drum like i think it confused a lot of people when they saw her playing that thing and they're like is that a drum and it's like yep that's a drum yeah and out of nowhere it calls the ancestors through the power of the i guess through the power of the drum in this case um as well as the power of you know the sea and everything and then the rock shows up you know <laughs> yeah, here's Disney the film. rock <laughs> <laughs> um but no, that's just a, a great example. You know, you don't see somebody playing a drum by themselves in the woods. I guess that would be extremely odd, but it, it brings people together. And I, you know, we talk about group gatherings. I also talked about the plague in medieval Europe, war dances. Just it's, we love to get together when there is rhythm in the air. It's just something just really inherently draws us in. And it's, it's a fascinating, fascinating thing to watch. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit more about we've obviously referred to it a lot, but, um, you know, I feel like so far we've talked about how it's kind of spiritual and a good thing. And we've talked about animals, um, you know, using it to communicate and the mother drum and the heart. But also we, we talked about with animals, uh, I'm trying to scare you. I'm trying to sound bigger. I'm trying to make it sound like there's an army of whatever chimpanzees, whatever, like I want you to be terrified and hear me across the forest that to this day, I mean, I feel like you just want these loud noises to scare people. Why don't we talk about that and the history of the war drum a little bit more? Mm -hmm. Part of it is like, I think you did a great example of saying, you know, I'm here, pay attention to me. And in this case with war drums, it also comes to the concept of war dances and with a lot of this, it's the idea of you really hit the nail on the head of, hey, we're here, there's more of us. And also a lot of it, it's also keeping people in time. Um, you really see this with a lot. I, I'm not going to veer off into history. You know, we're staying, trying to stay in the, in the social sciences here. But the idea of keeping rhythm, having the military drummer of everybody stand at attention, everybody look. And it's, it's a very westernized thing. 
this is how battle is going to go. This guy's going to snap the drum. They're going to make lots of loud noises. Everybody get your guns ready. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, like it was one of those, like, I want to go more into depth about this, but I cannot really jump into history if no. I'm focusing on it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But I mean, I can just think of other episodes I've done where, you know, George Washington put money and effort and time into getting the drummers to be tightened up and the the fife and everything because he heard it at first and he didn't like how it sounded. He said, this sounds terrible. So he focused energy and time into making the band sound better because it unifies everyone and, and makes you look better when you're literally when your your musicians sound better. And I just think back further about cavemen stretching, you know, getting a turtle shell flipped over and stretching, a, you know, an animal skin or a fish skin over it and hitting it. It, mm -hmm. it also communicates things over a long distance, which I think goes back to like the indigenous people and, and all these things of uh, you don't have a cell phone. You don't have a way to talk easily so you can tell, um, which is very animalistic, too, of, of like you raise your attention. Like mm -hmm. something, something's coming. Yeah. And I always think of um, ancient, it's, I, I'm always loath to say ancient Celtic, but you know, you think of ancient Euro uh, Western European warfare, and that was horns and drums play such a huge role in that, especially yeah. horns. And one of the most, uh, I believe it's called the Carinx. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but at uh, one of the national museums in Ireland, they were actually able to play a lot of these older instruments. And it's incredible how loud they are. I figured, okay, they're going to be whatever. And then you actually see them playing these ancient instruments and you're like, geez, I could hear this. It's like a Vuvuzela, but <laughs> thousands of years old. Oh yeah. yeah I, I, I hear like 15 of these guys and yeah, I'm going to go running. I don't want to deal with this. Yeah. <laughs> it's aggressive. And, you know, and we talk about materials, uh, the earliest, uh, the earliest form of a drum was, as you mentioned before, found in China and it's over 7,000 years old. And I just, I'm like, that is old. Yeah. And as you said, it was alligator skin stretched over a shell. Hmm. And that in itself is so fascinating that why an alligator skin? Yeah. And one of them, especially since no one really uses, you think gator skin now and you think like fairly tacky shoes. I'm sorry <laughs> for the you, fashionistas listen, listening. No, you just took it out of my mind. I was like, shoes <laughs> <laughs> it's just like you know yeah uh, it's i'm wondering about the actual material of the alligator skin because it's not a it's not as stretchy and as oily or can be as oiled or as easy to procure as goat skin which yes. i've noticed is that's the one you go to is goat skin or donkey skin um which which kind of hurts because i think donkeys are adorable but i mean back yeah, but in the a, day a 12 foot long alligator is a little harder to 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 kill than a docile donkey. <laughs> so, so sorry, Eeyore, you're gonna be an you're gonna be an instrument. Yeah, you're gonna be a drum. Sorry, because <laughs> that was a plot point in the original Pinocchio, um, which is one of the darkest children's stories I've ever read. Um, and now Guillermo del Toro is going to be remaking oh, it, and cool. I'm just like, oh, delightful. Uh, we yeah. won't sleep ever again. <laughs> um, but he's transformed into a donkey at one point. It's not like the Disney version where he's sort of transformed. No, uh, the homeboy is full on transformed. And then they try drowning him so that he can be made into a drum. Wow. Now, I like to think that maybe, though, as far as killing animals go, which goes back as far as, you know, forever. Yeah. It's sort of a I'm sure there's uh, like reverence and the sacredness of it kind of is like, a you know, um, like we respect you. We're going to turn you into the sacred instrument in some cultures. So if you're going to get killed, that's maybe a you know what I'm saying? Like that might be a uh, spiritually uh, a respectful way to go, I guess. Mm hmm. And one thing we'd have to ask uh, with that is, is it reverent, which I think it absolutely is, uh, or is it also, we really want to treat this goat, donkey, whatever ungulate, because that's the most common thing we see is it's usually ungulates, uh, animals that have cloven hooves like donkeys and uh, goats. But one thing I would also wonder is, is it also because you want that skin to be nice and clean and oiled and all pretty? Because if you have a really mangled old goat and you 
don't treat that skin really well when you are slaughtering it, well, you're not really going to have a good cover for your drum now, are you? Yeah. And I do remember reading, it was, um, this was actually a fiction book called A Girl Named Disaster by Nancy Farmer. Fast. It's a really, really good book that takes place in Zimbabwe in the 1980s. And the girl hears a fairly horrifying story about um, a spirit that jumps from person to person and animal to tree. And at one point, the spirit ends up in the body of the king's youngest wife. And the king's wife is saying all these things. And the king, in an act, in an act of abject horror, has the youngest wife murdered, killed, and then has her skin turned into a drum, which is then played. Wow. And then the drum begins to scream and scream until everybody goes crazy and the kingdom is crushed by itself. I, and like, and I remember thinking like, can human skin? And I was like, okay, let's focus on this article. I don't want to go down that road <laughs> yeah. on human skin drums. Oh, welcome to my world though, where you start to go one way and then you're like, no, 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 no. We're not talking about that human skin drum topic. <laughs> I mean, maybe, uh, I don't know if you've done that. Maybe that might be a good Halloween episode to do someday. Uh, but um, we have to, I've, in another place, I've read about having human skin bound books, but that's the most I've read. Uh, it's, I don't wow. think they do it with drum. I don't want to study the dermis on what it could be used for. It was just like, you know what, we'll stick with these certain types of animals that have been used. Um, yeah. it's basically another thing I would think of with these larger animals is that they're easy to procure. Uh, they're domesticated. So, I mean, yes, we got some, uh, wild alligators from 7,000 years ago, but by the time most, ma most drums, as you well know, are produced, it's because we have a large amount of domesticated animals that are going to be slaughtered and we'll probably use their meat for eating and use their bones for other things. And then, Hey, we got a nice uh goat skin yeah in fact i've got a couple of friends who are actually goat farmers and that's actually something they still sell after they slaughter the goats they're like okay we have meat and we also have goat skin available but they don't uh as far as i know it's just sold with just the fur not or hair technically i i don't think they've actually like tanned it be like okay here's it's a drumming time yeah no the um that's very uh like use every bit of the animal um kind of you know uh stuff and and i plan on doing i've been working on it for a while we've literally it's sometimes phone tag with booking shows takes will go on for a year but i've got an episode in the works about making the calf skin and the goat skin heads and i've seen i've done a little research on the tanning process which is really a um a pretty unpleasant process um that can include uh, brains. I had someone send me in a mm -hmm. message that we were talking about it where there was a saying, and I'm probably going to get it wrong. I should have his name, but it's it's buried in there. It's uh, I think he said that uh, there's a saying where it's like the animal doesn't have enough brains to tan its own hide. Um, yep. And there's a really interesting thing that I found where it was a, about a job that uh, I, I, be, I believe like 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 poor, poor, poor widows or paupers, these women in like medieval times would walk around and get paid like you know a like 50 cents a day to pick up uh i believe it was like dog poop and and just waste from animals and take it back to the tannery because they would use that in the process to break it down um which you know that's a pretty rough job but uh and the smell and just all this stuff so it's not a pleasant process yeah you're making me wish i had included a little bit on the chemistry of that because there is reason why um the tannins and other chemicals in that have such a good effect on preserving the hides. And there's also a social aspect to it. You actually nailed it. And it was a really common thing in the medieval world where tanning was so necessary. Uh, not, I mean, drums, I think, were a very minuscule part of that because sure. everybody needed tanning. But a little side story was, you know, William the Conqueror, who eventually took over England, he was the illegitimate son of a tanner's daughter and a lord. Hmm. And one of the ways that an invading village uh, decided to really insult him was throw out, as you mentioned, you know, dung and offal and all these bloody animal hides while screaming plenty of work for the Tanner's son. Huh. Which oh, had, man. It's like Game <laughs> of Thrones. I, you wonder where Mr. R. R. Martin got these ideas. Yeah. And sure enough, uh, he blew a gasket and um, destroyed the town. <laughs> I don't know whether he ended up tanning any of those hides. I think he tanned other hides, if you know what I mean. Yeah, exactly. 
Wow. But no, tanning has always been a gross science, material science. And, but at the same time, it's such a necessary science, like making these incredible instruments that are so useful. Yeah. And it's, it's one of the, one of the more fascinating things about writing this article. And it's a secret thing I love when it comes to certain articles is doing market research. I, I, I'm a, one of my a side gigs or not side gigs, but one of my hobbies is I absolutely love shopping and I love comparing prices and materials and sizes. And one thing that really struck me, and I mentioned this in the article, is the djembe itself, which is the most common drum that you see drum circles having. And the fact that I was like, huh, all my hippie buddies who are not exactly, you know, rolling in cash, although I had plenty of you know, rich hippie friends, you know, the Trustafarians. <laughs> and <laughs> nice. I love that. I'll never not love that term. Yeah. And I was just like, huh. So my professor from Mali who played the drum in my dance class, his was old school. It was very clear he got it from home and it was lovingly oiled and it was it had some scratches on it. But you could tell this this thing had been around like this thing was it was the equivalent of having a really nice baby grand piano. Like yeah, no sure. one else was allowed to touch it. If you looked at it funny, he gave you a dirty look. It was <laughs> very, very precious to him. Yeah. And then meanwhile, I'm seeing, you know, I'm thinking of the example, like Caleb from Torrance, California, dragging <laughs> his djembe around. That's got like stickers on it. For, yeah. I'm going to really date myself. Gore Bush. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. 2004. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, and it's very clear that Caleb from Torrance, California got his for like 25 bucks off Amazon. Yeah. Whereas, you know, my professor, his was passed down from generation to generation. And I was just like, where, where is the difference between all of these? And so I just started researching all the different manufacturer types where you can get them. And before I knew it, I had spent two hours looking up drums and I was like, wow, there is such a gauntlet. And I'm very curious to see not only the sound difference, because that was one thing that I wanted to include, but once again, word limit. And I'm like, we're not going to delve into physics, yeah. but the sound quality of the djembe absolutely changes. But I'm sure you've covered that before. Well, not actually, I really need to do more of a in-depth djembe episode, but you're so right about the volume of it. I just think the djembe is everything in one, if that makes sense. It's just like you have your low notes, you have your high notes, you have everything kind of in between. It's the right shape. Not that the other, like other tons and tons and tons of other hand percussion drums aren't, but it just fits between your legs so well. Um, I did a thing where I I worked for two or three years with a kid's music program where I would uh, it was like classes. It, it was not like lessons. It was classes where we would have, OK, it's uh, it's, you know, um, the animal wheel. Let's go. OK, where does the pack of the pig go? Goes here's the front of the pig. Great. But there would be a um, djembe time and I would go up front and I'd have a djembe and I'd play and um, and then kids would come up and play it. it it's so much more attainable for any age, uh, as opposed to a drum set where that's a lot. And, and even then with like zero to five year olds, I had kids who would kind of fall forward and end up falling kind of into the drum set, which was a little bit of a nightmare. But, um, something about the djembe is just so, so special. Now, do you think though, that like with the long history of the djembe that sometimes like having a group of let you said, Caleb from, from California <laughs> playing it, do you think that it maybe is there's some cultural appropriation with with playing the djembe in situations like that? And I want to say up front to all the drummers out there, I don't really think anyone is being disrespectful, but just for the sake of conversation, what do you think about that? I think it's a really it's it's fairly complicated to ask. And that's something I always have had trouble with myself. Um, so ultimately, within cultural appropriation, and I, I uh, I've worked with a lot of people on discussing this. So a big thing you have to ask is, is there cultural exchange happening? Mm. So uh, the, my first example I think of when I think of djembe players is I say, you know, I mentioned my dance class that I took where the professor is from Africa and he's telling us, this is how you're going to dance. This is what I have deemed as a member of this culture. What's okay. I'm working closely with another member of that culture who is from Burkina Faso, which is a different, it's a different uh, country. But we're working together on this, working with you. This is a cultural exchange. 
So that's the exchange of we're working together on this because he's like, I want you undergraduates and this lone, very weird graduate student who's like 50 and in the class. I want you guys to understand this is my background. This is our background and you're going to learn about it and it's going to open your minds with a bunch of random people playing the djembe. I always, you have to, you do have to ask, okay, where did they learn it? Are they being respectful? Like, we were talking 1999 uh, Woodstock. Garen, I would I would be of the opinion probably not, but I wasn't there, so I I couldn't say. A good example was um, a young man who is I believe he is of Ojibwe descent was making fun at po- pointing fun and but also being very upset and emotional where he was at a big rally and there was a bunch of older white hippies like you can. You can, you can imagine the type yeah. and they are playing a native American in, native American from indigenous Americas. They are playing a drum with the same sticks that you'd be playing at an indigenous gathering and making weird noises. Mm. And, and to that, it's very mocking. And it's yeah. to that is ultimate cultural appropriation. And he confronts them while well, he's also making fun of them, but he also says, quite frankly, guys, I'm like, my heartbeat is racing because I feel like they're mocking my culture. They've taken my culture and it's almost like they're making fun of it. And for a lot of people, cultural appropriation really can be emotional for obvious reasons. The parties who cultures they're from and the parties who they're like, Hey, I just thought this headdress was cool. You know, why are you being a jerk? I just like this drum. Why are you being so mean? It's, you know, you're not sitting down and saying, okay, here's, the level I'm willing to do. And here's the level I'm willing to work with you on. I'm just going to take what I want and do what I want with it. And uh, so it can be so complicated on that uh, because my first thought is for all I know, everybody in the drum circle all did a study abroad uh, in Burkina Faso and they all learned from really nice Igbo elders, although Igbo is actually Nigeria. Um, And, you know, this is, they brought it back as part of a medical anthropology study, because I mentioned at one point, a healing circle for medical professionals, this actually was a research study to see if doing drum circles would help people in post traumatic stress syndromes. And they actually found out it did. Albeit part of it was, is it a creative expression? Is it a social expression where you're getting together and you're not necessarily opening up and going over trauma and feelings, which can be really uncomfortable for some. It's just simply, I'm surrounded by other people who've experienced something similar. And this is a way in which I heal and am able to express myself creatively. That's a great point. I mean, and and you you are so right on you shouldn't look at people and assume that they didn't study it and they don't understand it. And it makes me think of, uh, you know, and I'm sure a lot of the drummers listening to this know what I'm talking about, where if you see very, very, very good drummers on um, social media who are, um, let's say, just white guys and they're playing Latin rhythms, but they've studied it and know every single one and have a huge respect for it. And they know the slight variations and they know the differences and they know the cultural background. I think that's great. I think that's showing respect and is being like, you know, uh, about as uh, like what are you supposed to do? Never play it. And then you're not introducing it to other people. And then it doesn't get spread. And that, that culture then doesn't get shared with people around the world. Um, it's a sticky subject for sure. Yeah. I, part of me wants to make, because I'm, I collect a lot of art myself, indigenous art and just art around the world. And I do always have to ask, I almost like have drawn myself a flow chart, which is, Um, did I purchase this from a local person, for example, like that's the first thing you ask is, did I buy this off of Amazon or did I buy it from a local merchant who this is part of their livelihood and it's part of their culture. And because that's ultimately what it's supposed to be is a cultural exchange, not an appropriation. Yeah. Um, and so that's where, you know, I really think of, for instance, if you're buying a drum from, artists who are located in West Africa, or they have a connection there. It's like you're supporting that. And then not only that, but are you going to use, you know, are you using it as part of a cultural exploration? Or are you just going to sit in your dorm and bang it a few times while moaning? You know? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah no, it's, that's, it's, 
ultimately it's about exchange and not appropriation for sure. Okay. Great answer. Um, now you, I want to switch gears here and talk a little bit about, um, just cause it doesn't come up much on the show, but I liked how you talked about heavy metal drumming, um, and about how the drumming, which, which I don't know if you're a big like death metal fan or anything, but obviously anyone who knows anything about metal music or heavy music with the double bass drums and all that stuff knows the intensity of the drumming and that that brings this force to it. And that I think like, like you were saying comes from that war drum feeling. Um, and that's obviously on purpose. Um, so I just think that's really neat. You touched upon that, but connected it to the, to the, um, you know, the drum circle, which is also loud and, and all this stuff, but, but let's be real. Heavy metal is typically meant to kind of amp you up and get you excited. Correct. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I always, uh, one, <laughs> one fictional character that was in my mind when I was writing this article, have you, did you ever watch the show Metalocalypse? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Pickles, Pickles, the drummer was absolutely <laughs> yeah. in my head the entire time. Because one thing that first of all, I love his Wisconsin accent. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, he just sounds like so many people I know. Yeah. And the fact that he is so tiny in comparison to the other members of the band, but he is so aggressive. He is so wild and he is a redhead. And, <laughs> you know, he plays these giant drums. In fact, one of the Metalocalypse songs I'll occasionally play when I need to just pound something out. And it is extremely heavy on the drums and Pickles sings in it is Hatred Copter. <laughs> yeah. First of all, because the lyrics are so stupid. Oh, you man. know, I fly a gigantic monster. I'm Captain Evil Stomper. I get to wear big black helmets and just <laughs> the drums are going wild because they're so big, but they're also so fast. Because yeah supposed to be flying the hatred concept. exactly it, it's it just makes you feel the hatred i love that you're talking about metalocalypse as the you know the phd the doctor on the show <laughs> which for, for the drummers out there i believe that's gene hoagland who is just an a monster drummer who i think played with death who when he practices i think most people have seen this online he he puts weights on his ankles and weighs down his ankles so that he can, you know, work out his double bass and he plays with like combat boots on, um, which is awesome. And then Brian Beller, who's a, I'm just, now this is all music shop stuff, but Brian Beller is a great bass player. I saw him play with, uh, for people listening, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of the aristocrats, um, which is just a great band with Marco Miniman, but, um, Brian Beller is, uh, from Metalocalypse as the bass player, but, um, that's so funny. Yeah, and that's something that uh, I thought was really fascinating when watching Metalocalypse with my then boyfriend, who's now my husband. We actually that was one of the sh we watched a lot. We watched a lot of animation together, and uh, a big thing that was noted was not only is Pickles smaller, but he's also the only one that doesn't wear combat boots. He wears uh, basically gym shoes or Keds yeah. because he needs it to be so fast. That's funny and ironic because Gene Hoagland, who's the drummer, yeah. wears combat boots, but. But yeah, um, it's fascinating to see because that's that high kickstand that you have to use with yeah. that, which is a completely different form of the other drums that we've talked about in this article where with the djembe's, I trying to remember every all the shoes that I didn't really pay attention because at least in the dance classes, we had to perform barefoot always. And one of the things that the dancer, the head dance teacher told us was because we have to feel the rhythm in our feet, sure. which yeah, that was it was awesome. I mean, on the one hand, we really made the gym stink. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all these all these hippie girls whipping off their keens like, yay! Yeah, their started. stinky feet. <laughs> oh, keens. I got our we have we have tons of kids keens. That's our go to kid show. They're good. I I literally live in my keens until they fall apart. And then I don't even want to like throw them out. I want to like bury them in the backyard, <laughs> maybe get like a little bagpiper for them. Yeah, play a uh, drum, play a djembe around them. <laughs> I'm going to hire a job. Well, that's the thing, though, is when you think about that, like, and that's this is one thing to talk about with culture is that, you know, I'm like, would you play djembe's at a funeral if you're in America, if you're somewhere else? You know, you hear of funeral drums in some cases, um, but then you think of American funerals, you know, you don't really see those. I mean, well, this is all just something. New Orleans. New Orleans has oh, good point. different, you know, obviously the, uh, the second line uh, yeah. and that you know, that party kind of atmosphere, which, you know, it's a sad party, but obviously, um, which there's an episode on that. Um, yeah, it's so oh. different. Yeah. 
I guess it's because I'm from the uh, little bit about my background. I'm from the south side of Chicago and my and, you know, very Irish background. And my first thought is, okay, someone's dying. Some we're putting somebody in the ground. Let's uh, whip out the bagpipes and <laughs> yeah, sure. for our brows and yeah. Bye grandpa. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's, uh, well, you know, that's, that's most people though. It is kind of sad. I think different cultures have, uh, different, views on what's happening at that point in time um you know is it a sad thing is it a happy thing should we be celebrating our drums happy our drums sad our drums aggressive it kind of ties it all together mm -hmm. and i mean it, as i mentioned before and this is something i think that is the thesis of the article is it is a social instrument you know and i guess that's the only thing you think of when i guess i was thinking of another form of a drum at a funeral is the 21 gun salute where somebody is, you know, where there's a drummer who's really keeping a heavy time and then all of the Marines or I, I think it's Marines. I'm trying to remember who exactly is, but somebody does the, you know, they fire off the gun 21 times before the person is buried yeah. and it has to be via drum. And, but that's also to keep people in line. It's okay. Everybody ready. Okay. Let's get going. Okay. There we go. First round done. Second round done. Yeah. You know, I was talking about the little drummer boy and it's now it recalled me why I was thinking of that is uh, if you've seen that episode of the West Wing, it's one of the best episodes of the West Wing where they bury a gentleman who was an army veteran who was homeless. And the uh, one of the chiefs of staff or chief White House chief of communications is able to pull some strings so that he's bur buried in Arlington National Cemetery. And the it's it's juxtaposed with a choir of little kids singing um, the little drummer boy while this man is being buried uh, with a drummer and given a 21 gun salute. Hmm, man. Very, very powerful episode. Uh, definitely like get a box of Kleenexes to watch yeah, it. Yeah, I love the West Wing. I got, I think it was during the beginning of COVID where like I was watching like four or five episodes of the West Wing a day, <laughs> just like oh, I bur burning yeah. through it that. And then I got really into cheers, um, oh. which, you know, <laughs> it was COVID. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's just like, don't we all wish President Bartlett was our dad? Yeah, my middle my so Bart, my name is Thomas. My middle name is Bartlett. Um, distant relative Josiah Bartlett, who that character is obviously named after. What? So, wow. Yeah. Everyone thinks that it's uh, Bartholomew, but it's actually uh, Bart is short for Bartlett. So, you know, what's really funny. Uh, Saint, we were talking about tanning and skins and whatnot. Uh, Saint Bartholomew is the patron saint of skinners and tanners and leather workers because he was supposedly skinned alive. Oh, my God. A little. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's kind of great. This is like, what I use my PhD for. I just yeah. I'm a walking Wikipedia of random weird facts. Oh, that's awesome. All right. Well, as we're getting close to the end here, um, I want to, of course, talk about you a little bit more. But um, can we just like wrap up with I want to start with the question at the very beginning and just kind of maybe you can give me like, you know, a simple little answer here that you can, people can walk away with. What is really out of all that stuff, the scientific reason why humans love drumming? It would be humans are attracted to sounds that are repetitive and that work closely with our emotions that are going to heighten or downplay our emotions and that are, you, you know, is quintessentially universal in that format. Mm. That's awesome. I mean, this has just been so cool. So, um, yeah, you obviously are a great writer. What, what other kind of things do you write about? I mean, obviously, besides this article on drumming. So I write for Massive Science um, on a series of different articles, a uh, series of different topics, I should say, ranging from forest fires to app design to the role of women in STEM and education. And it basically is my focus is on fun, interesting facts out that, you know, we just would think like, OK, what's something happening in the world right now that we'd like people to know about? Of course, I say fun, and, and my first thought was that's ridiculously tongue-in-cheek right now because um, another one of my articles just came out that is about the effects of the drought and the incredible heat wave in Oregon specifically. The Pacific Northwest has a huge, you know, hold on my heart. And, you know, seeing the effects of that. And so for me, being able to tell the stories of science as well as a lot of social science and a lot of history um, to me, being able to spread the word and talk about that is so crucial as a writer. Yeah. 
which your writing in general is very, um, I mean, from what I've seen and just talking to you, obviously, because we've been talking about Metalocalypse and South Park and stuff. It's very, you're very approachable, which um, most of the like, you know, doctors I've had on the show are. And maybe it's just because this format is a little bit looser where you're not, you know, doing it, your thesis presentation or whatever, where you can have a little more fun. But um, I think it's great. And you've just in a in a in a virtual room full of drummers um it's been fascinating and you've really held your own and um we should also mention that you have a brand spanking new baby uh <laughs> as of this week right when was she so today's tuesday he or she she when was she born uh thursday at midnight <laughs> oh my gosh well i am just honored that you you know are you feeling okay I am feeling pretty good. Um, she's number two. Um, I also have an, as I mentioned before, the Metalocalypse watching boyfriend is now my Metalocalypse watching husband. <laughs> uh, we've been together for eleven years. Yeah. Uh, he's also a scientist by training, although his focus is on immunology and biology. Um, and I'm actually hearing her cry in the next room. I think she, because she's like, "Who is this bald guy holding me? Why isn't he my mother?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're not my mom. Yeah, but we're doing we're doing pretty good um, as best we can. Um, but yeah, just it's been kind of a wild ride. But nope, that's got to keep on keeping on. Yeah. OK, well, um, uh, real quick, I want to mention the the person who was talking to me about tanning before and told me that cool saying about, uh, you know, using brains and the, uh, the, the brains for do it was Robert Sala, S-A-L-A, mm -hmm. Robert Sala. Sorry, Robert, if I mispronounced your last name. So thanks, Robert, for we had a cool conversation about tanning. But um Awesome. Well, Kristen, on that note, um, I think this week, everyone listening will skip the bonus episode because um, Kristen has a uh, week old baby and a four year old with a broken arm, um, which we talked about before. So I hope she feels better. That's got to be pretty confusing and rough for her. Yeah, but she's she's a tough girl and <laughs> we're going to do this. But thank you so much, Bart. This was fabulous. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.